Amen. Well, thank you, uh, Brother Schneider. Thank you all uh, for being here, uh, fellowshipping with us. And for those out there in cyberspace, uh, we hope that something that is spoken here or done here will touch you in a special way and have the effect of drawing you closer to the Father. That's really our goal in the Ahad, to draw you closer to the Father. If, if we could just do that much, then we will be um, happy that that has happened. So uh, at this time, uh, I'm going to uh, present uh, a message here. And so um, this... Uh, this is a, uh, a a teaching I've been working on for a while, and um, I have entitled this uh, The Millennial Reign, a Sukkot Story. And if you study uh, the millennial reign of Messiah and its uh, connections to Sukkot, there are a lot of startling connections. Uh, now, the millennial reign has something that um, has fascinated me for many, many years as I studied scripture, because it engenders hope in the life of the believer. And as we're going to see in this teaching, uh, we're going to see conditions that our Heavenly Father explains to us that show us that there is a better time coming. Now, when we look at uh, Sukkot. Uh, we know that Yeshua himself, um, it says that he tabernacled amongst men. That's in the New Testament. He tabernacled amongst men. Uh, and it's it's believed, some at least in some quadrants, that Yeshua was born during the time of Sukkot. And that this may be the reason why, um, you know, there was no room in the end because everybody and their brother was coming from every quadrant and they were taking up the inns. They were taking up the places of, uh, because they were there for one of the three big feasts. Uh, we call those the Shalosh Regalim, the three big feasts. And so, um, so this, this, uh, this, uh, Sukkot theme, which, uh, which sort of foretells the millennial reign, it really speaks about Yahweh's promise to return to earth and tabernacle, uh, which means he's dwelling with Israel, which is us. You know, even Christians who don't think they're a part of Israel says in the New Testament that they are the Israel of God. You're going to have to argue with the Apostle Paul if you deny that, because the Apostle Paul says right out, he refers to Gentiles as the Israel of God. So you are a member of Israel. And so uh, he's going to dwell with Israel in a way never before experienced in history. Now, this is also um, spoken of in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 32 to 33. And he will be great and will be called the son of the Most High. And the Master Yah will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So uh, basically, what we're saying here is that, yes, Yeshua came. He was born of a virgin. He revealed himself to the world. He died for the sins of mankind. He was resurrected, and he went up. He showed himself to many, to many uh, disciples. And then he was resurrected up, but we are looking for his second coming. And when it says tabernacled amongst us at this future time in the millennial reign, it literally talks about his presence coming down to earth. If you have doubt of that, just read Zechariah chapter 14, where it literally says Yahweh comes down to earth. This is Yeshua, the very son of Elohim, and sets his foot on the Mount of Olives. And he inaugurates his millennial reign. I'm not going to get into Zechariah 14 because I've got limited time today. But what I would like to uh, communicate to you is a story. Because this story ties into the life of the believer. And so this story is called The Boy and the Farm. Let me uh, see if I can get this up here a little better for us.
Okay, so um, basically the story goes like this. As a uh, child, Jack's father was a horse trainer who frequently had to move from ranch to ranch. And he uh, was training horses. That, that was a uh, kind of job that would take him uh, different places, different times. And so there's disruption in the life of the child. Think about that. Because of this, the boy's school career was constantly interrupted. He always had to start at a new school, right? So during his senior year, a teacher asked him to write about what he wanted to be when he grew up. Without hesitating, Jack wrote a paper about his goal to own, own a horse ranch. He was very meticulous in his writing and included drawings of buildings, stables, and even a detailed house plan. Two days later, his teacher returned his paper with an F written on the top page. Jack asked his teacher why he received an F, to which the teacher responded, this is an unrealistic dream for a boy like you, who has no money, no resources, who comes from a traveling family. There is no chance he will reach this goal. Imagine a teacher saying that to a boy, crushing his dream. The teacher then offered Jack a chance to rewrite the paper with a more realistic attitude. After several days, Jack brought the paper back to his teacher without any changes. <laughs> he said, keep the F and I will keep my dream. Imagine that. Now, Jack owns a 200-acre horse ranch. Jack is all grown up now. He owns a 200-acre horse ranch, a 4,000-square-foot house, where he displays his school paper framed over the fireplace. So what's the moral of this story? No one can tell you that your dreams are unrealistic. You have to follow what spiritual direction Yah fills within you, despite what other people may think of your goals. Never give up. Move forward with persistence. And don't let anyone take your dreams away. So what can we say about this? Well, we who are believers in Messiah are looking forward to an eternal kingdom. Now, this, this is somewhat of a secular example, but it highlights, it highlights the tenacity of some to believe in something better and hold on for dear life. And we as believers in Yeshua must also embody this same attitude. In fact, I'm going to quote to you something further on in this, in, this, uh, in this teaching, which relates to this, about enduring, enduring. And so the life of a believer, we have to learn to endure. Why are we enduring? Because we see a better kingdom. We see a better situation for the world and for us and for our family. Let's see if I can get rid of this here. Okay, so uh, what I'd like to do now uh, is look at this Abrahamic covenant promises uh, because all of the promise that there would be a new kingdom, a new uh, a world, a new time of peace. And all of it had to do with Yeshua Messiah ruling and reigning as king for a thousand years. He's returned in his glorified body and he's ruling and reigning. And I'm going to show you some of the scriptures which point to this. Now it says, uh, Yahweh said to Abram, go to your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in all and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This has to do with a blessing conferred upon Abraham and his descendants. And in the New Testament, you'll, you'll uh, see various scriptures which talk about that we are the children of Abraham. We are the children of Abraham. We resonate that hope. 
and that promise as the Father guides us. Now, this is in Deuteronomy 31 through 6. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where Yahweh your Elohim has driven you, and return to the master your Elohim, you and your children, and obey his voice and all that I commanded you today, with all your heart, with all your soul, then Yahweh your Elohim will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. Now, pay attention to that right there. Oops, let me go back here. Pay attention. Then Yahweh will restore your fortunes. And uh, it talks about here, uh, he will gather you again from, from all the peoples where Yahweh your Elohim has scattered you. Now, understand that this was written after the first exodus. This was written after the first exodus. Because Deuteronomy, that this, this is speaking to the children of Israel who have left Egypt. The first time. And they now are in the wilderness for 40 years. And Yahweh is leading them by the hand, so to speak, through the leadership of Moses and Aaron. But he says he promises again, Yahweh will gather you again when he has mercy upon you. If you're outcast or in the uttermost parts of the heaven, from there Yahweh your Elohim will gather you. And from there he will take you. And Yahweh your Elohim will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make the more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. It's going to be even greater than the first exodus. This seems to imply there will be a second gathering. Second gathering. And Yahweh, your Elohim, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. Then we go on to the Davidic promises. Now notice this here, 2 Samuel 7, 10 through 13. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the master declares to you that the master will make you a house. And when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish this, his kingdom. Notice this, it's talking about David here. David, King David. There he is, King David and Samuel. Uh, or Samuel's probably here and here's King David. Uh, and uh, in other words, uh, I will raise up your offspring after you and who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This has to be an eternal being, because if it says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, it's clearly, as we know, talking about Yeshua Messiah, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he is of the Davidic line. We have many more teachings on that as well. So uh, at the second coming, uh, these covenants will be fulfilled as Israel is regathered from the nations. Uh, Matthew 24, 31, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. Now notice this. This is in Zechariah chapter 12, 10 through 14. And this is talking about, a. I believe, it could have already happened or it's going to happen. I think it may happen in our generation. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, who's that? Yeshua Messiah. They pierced his hands and his feet. They shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. In fact, uh, you know, and second thought, I think this is going to happen in the future for sure, because it's talking about the inhabitants of Jerusalem, which uh, largely is comprised of the Jews who don't see the truth. There's a veil over their eyes right now. On that day, the morning in Jerusalem will be as great as the morning for Hadad and Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn, each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves the family of the house of Levi by itself and their wives by themselves. And it goes on. The entire land will mourn because 
they what? It says here, when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced. Why are they mourning? You think they could be mourning because they missed so many centuries of knowing who the very Redeemer was? I think that's possible. I think that's probably part of it right there. So uh, what about uh, this millennial reign? Uh, we see some scriptures that talk about there's going to be a spirit of supplication poured out. The, uh, the, the, um, the, um, uh, the, the Jews who are part of the covenant, but they're not in Messiah, uh, will, will come to recognize him for who he is, and a spirit of mourning will come upon him. So uh, conditions during the millennium uh, is, is described as a perfect environment physically and spiritually. Well, this is in Micah 4, 2 through 4. And many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the master, to the house of the Elohim of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the master from Jerusalem. This is speaking of Yeshua when he's back ruling and reigning. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. Do we see that happening yet? As all the people of the earth beat their swords into plowshares? No, this is a future prophecy. And their spears and the pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the master of hosts has spoken. Think about that. That kind of condition. There's going to be peace on the earth. They're going to beat their swords, their guns. At least in this time, it would be guns and cannons, right? Into plowshares. They will go back to tilling the ground as Abel did. Or actually, uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, tilling the ground. Well, Cain did the tilling the ground, but the children of Israel would till the ground when they came into the land. I guess what I should say there. Cain's not a very good example. <laughs> he killed his brother Abel. All right, so Isaiah 32, 17 through 18. And the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness, and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. So the millennial reign is described as a time of peace. No more war. Uh, there will be the Torah will go forth from Zion, and the whole world will be inducted into the Torah. Right now, the Torah is, is kept by a very small minority on the earth. And even then, it's not kept in the perfection that it was intended to be under King Yeshua. So also, we see that there's going to be joy and comfort in the millennial reign. Now, um, this is in Isaiah 61, 7. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. This is talking about a future time. Uh, the, the second exodus, the regathering, and the time of joy, which is a Sukkot theme. It's a time of joy because Yahweh is tabernacling with us. Yeshua, the very son of Elohim, is tabernacling with us. Yahweh in the flesh, essentially. Isaiah 41 through 2, Comfort, comfort my people, says your Elohim. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she, she has received from the master's hand double for all her sins. Zechariah 14, 16. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Imagine that. Right now, the, the, the majority of the world refuses to honor or accept or even acknowledge tabernacles. In fact, even the majority of the church world who poos that idea as something that's old. That's Old Testament. That's all done away with. Now we can keep our false holidays like Christmas and Easter and Halloween and all of these filthy, um, polluted uh, holidays that borrowed from paganism. 
And they, and they they basically consider the Torah of Elohim in his appointed times as an unclean rag. The Bible actually says that. They'll consider it as an unclean rag in the times of the Gentiles. But at this time, in the time of the restoration of the tent of Jacob, when the tent of Jacob is raised up again in this final generation, and when Yeshua returns, if you read Zechariah 14, it shows Yeshua turning, returning and setting foot on uh, on on uh, the Mount of Olives, and it inaugurates the millennial reign. And it says here, the people that are left on the earth are going to go up from year to year to worship the King Yahweh of hosts and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, what about the other feast? I don't know. I don't know, but specifically it says they're going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles in the millennial reign. Okay, so also it's going to be a time of obedience and holiness. Uh, this is Isaiah 35, 4, and a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Interesting that the early believers, the disciples, were called followers of what? Remember? Followers of the way. Remember that? It actually says that in the New Testament. They were, they were called followers of the, of the way. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. <laughs> Imagine that. Even the most uh, knuckleheaded uh, believers. <laughs> the Father will help keep them from going astray. Uh, Isaiah 11, 9, And they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Master as the waters cover the sea. There shall be no more killing animals for food. There shall be a restoration. On there, and I've got other scriptures that I can show that too. Isaiah 65 16. So that he who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the Elohim of truth, and he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the Elohim of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten and are hidden from my eyes. This would be the time that we're in now, which is the former troubles. Habakkuk 2 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the masters as the waters cover the sea. Right now, we see the earth being filled with the filth of the evil one. We see LGBTQ on the rise. We see pedophilia being exposed everywhere. We see political corruption at a level rarely ever seen in history, except maybe toward the end of the Roman Empire. We see uh, the harm that mankind is doing to one another. We see war. We see uh, uh, there is lack of sustenance in various places. Uh, the, the difficulty to get food and water. The financial strain and the situation getting harder and harder for people. And so uh, the entire world right now is under the control of the little G God. That's Satan himself. Now, ultimately, Yahweh has control of everything, but, he, but because of man's sin, they open doorways to the devil. And that's what's happening. They open doorways. Okay, and so, but in the time of the millennial reign, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the master as the waters cover the sea. Now, uh, what about uh, uh, the... Uh, what about this? This is in Isaiah chapter 4, uh, 2, 4, uh, Isaiah 2, 4. And he shall judge among the nations, shall rebuke many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears and the pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, uh, who taught war to mankind? Remember who that was? Remember it says Azazel, one of the fallen ones, taught war to mankind before the flood. Uh, and that's I've uh, discussed that before in other teachings uh, for those who follow me. But, okay, so Messiah Yeshua is ruling as king. Isaiah 9, 3, 6, 7, uh, you have multiplied the nation, you've increased the joy, they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as in the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment roiled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Battle will be finished. All the works of evil and, and warfare will be finished and burned. 
For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty Elohim, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. Well, history of mankind up until now, there has been peace that has ended. There has been war. In fact, war has, has cursed the earth for centuries. But of this time in history, there will be peace of which there is no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the master of hosts will do this. Isaiah 11, 1 through 10, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from the root shall bear fruit and the spirit of the master shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the master. And his delight shall be in the fear of the master. This would be the master Yahweh in this case. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Now, this is also talked about in the book of Revelation, where it says out of his mouth, here is Yeshua, here's Yeshua coming back on a white stallion. If you remember that picture in Revelation, it says out of his mouth issues a sword with which he shall slay the enemies of Elohim. This is how he literally by force takes the earth. The first time Yeshua Messiah came as a lamb, but here we see Yeshua is returning as a conquering king. The second time he comes as a lion and he shall submit the wicked under his feet. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Notice this, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. I, I What I think that means is, is that there will be a restoration of peace in the animal kingdom. Right now we have predator and we have prey and that will be destroyed. That will be destroyed, that dynamic. But I also think there is a allegorical meaning that there will be no more people trying to oppress other people because uh, people in the book of Enoch are also described by various animals. So uh, potentially, uh, or it might be the Jubilees, Jubilees or Enoch, one of them, but it talks about this in there where it describes them as animals. I think it's Enoch where it talks about that, but I think there's going to be a literal application of this too. The animal kingdom will be restored. Those servants who are faithful will also rule with him. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule in justice. He will establish princes, elders. Jerusalem is going to be the political center of the world. Uh, and it may be New Jerusalem, um, possibly. Okay, so it says here, uh, Jesus said to them, or Yeshua said to them, truly I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So here they are, the elders of Elohim, judging, probably from New Jerusalem, which is elevated above the earth. Zechariah 8.3, thus says, Master, I have returned to Zion, will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the master of hosts, the holy mountain. Now, I tried to find a picture here that showed New Jerusalem elevated in the clouds, ruling over the earth. Uh, so I thought that was a pretty good one uh, there. Now, what about this, the devil? What's going to happen to him? Because most of mankind's troubles are because the devil is tempting. Now, now, James says that we can't say the devil made us do it because we're led away of our own lust. But who provokes those lusts? Who provokes those things? That is clearly the devil. And so Satan will be bound for a thousand years to no longer trouble mankind. Revelation 20, uh, 2 through 7, and he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must release for a little while. I'll probably do another teaching on that at some point, but 
But in this millennial reign, the devil will be chained. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those uh, to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Yeshua for the word of Elohim and those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Well, hopefully that will be you and I. We'll take part in the first resurrection because we have placed our trust in the shed blood of Yeshua, which is the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And it says, over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of Elohim and of Messiah, and they shall reign with him for a thousand years. Then it says, when a thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison. It says, for a short time. So really, that thousand years is a parallel of Sukkot. It's of Sukkot. The time where there will be a joyous, and Yahweh will be tabernacling, his, or tabernacling, his son will be tabernacling with us. Okay, so uh, what are the encouragements for believers um, here? Well, uh, we have a great hope. We have the perfected earth to look forward to. We have no more war to look forward to. We have no more poverty to look forward to. We have the, uh, the earth will be restored to its pristine state. Those of you out there who, are part, who uh, think this Green New Deal will solve everything, it won't. It won't. Only Yeshua Messiah will purify things. When he returns from heaven, it says in Zechariah 14, he will set foot on the Mount of Olives, and there should be a great chasm, and fresh water shall, shall flow, and it'll go into the sea and into the hinter sea. It says that it shall purify the waters of the earth. When you think about how polluted the waters are in the ocean right now, Yeshua, when he returns, he will restore the earth to its purified, pristine state. This is what we read in uh, Zechariah chapter 14. Now, so uh, what, do, what is the call then for believers? We need to endure until the end. This is what Messiah told us. But he that it shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, 1 Corinthians 2.9 uh, is basically a scripture that tells us that we can't even imagine how beautiful this new world is going to be. It is going to be something outside of our imagination because we live in such a corrupted existence that it's going to be something that we can't even understand until we're in it and we're experiencing it for ourselves. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which Yahweh hath prepared for them that love him. Haggai 2, 5 through 9, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear you not, for thus saith the master of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the master of hosts, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the master of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the master of hosts. In this place will I give peace, saith the master of hosts. Yahweh will be dwelling with us. Its glory will be in such a way that no one can deny it. It will be for a thousand years. And we are those who look forward to that. The city on a hill, the shining beacon of hope for all of us. And so my challenge for all of you today, grab hold of him. Grab hold of him. The Grab the tzitzit and receive your healing of your heart and hold on to his hand as you start to sink in the waters like Peter did when he stepped out of the boat. And remember, he looked around, he looked at the waves, and he began to sink. No, hold on to him. And keep your eyes fixed on the master because... There are great things in store for you and for those who believe. And so with that, I thank you. Shalom, shalom.
Wonderful, wonderful. Professor Smith will be back next week for another episode. That was uh, just couldn't have been better, brother. Thank you so much. So anointed. Hyson? The Shema. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu is one Yahweh. We will love Yahweh Eloheinu with all our hearts and with all our souls and with all our stuff. And these words that Yahweh commands us will be in our hearts and we will teach them diligently to our children and we will talk of them when we sit in our houses and when we walk down the road and when we recline and when we arise and we will bind them for a sign upon our hands and they will be as adornments between our eyes and we will write them on the supports of our houses and even on our gates. Zakhar, remember, when you became the Yachad of Israel, you vowed to separate yourself from the sessions of the deceitful ones in order to depart into the wilderness to prepare the way of Yahweh, as it is written, in the wilderness prepare the way of Yahweh, make level in the desert a highway for our Elohim. This alludes to the study of the Torah and Kadosh writings that Elohim commanded through Moshe, giving us that which is sufficient to live according to everything that has been revealed from time to time, and according to what has been revealed to the prophets by his Kadosh Ruach. And all this we will gladly hear and joyfully do. Last words. And so we, creatures of clay kneaded with water, a heap of dust and a heart of stone, for what virtue are we reckoned to be worthy of this? For into an ear of dust you have put a new word, and have engraved everlasting things on hearts of stone. You have caused straying spirits to return, that they may enter into covenant with you and stand before you forever, even in the everlasting abode illuminated with perfect light forever, with no more darkness for unending modes of joy and unnumbered ages of peace. Shalom, shalom. And let it be so unto us and our generations by your word, for the master's sake and for, all, for the sake of all creation. Amen and shalom, shalom. And now the service is finito. Again, we thank you for coming by and being a part of it. The more we have in, the more anointing we get, right? Hallelujah. So at uh, this time, we usually go over to Professor Smith for a discussion. You can be dismissed if you like, remembering to come back next time. Or you can stay for a discussion, and you can be part of that discussion because we're turning off.